All right, this third set of lecture notes uh, brings us into our second kind of theme of things to discuss with China. The first two looked at the making of the modern Chinese state. This second theme is looking at the political institutions in China, and this is our foray into kind of discussing uh, a very strong one-party authoritarian system compared to the other countries that we will uh, play with uh, during the, the rest of the course of the semester. <clears throat> so, when we talk about China, uh, they are an authoritarian, single-party communist system. Uh, officially, they would denote themselves as a socialist state under the People's Democratic Dictatorship, denoting that the people are the ones who embrace uh, authoritarian rule. They are a unitary system of government, just like the UK, which we discussed first. Uh, they don't really have an electoral system, that there are mechanisms for choosing individuals who are part of the Chinese People's Congress, uh, which we'll talk about in several slides down the road, but they don't really have one for us to kind of compare uh, successfully in terms of looking at like Russia or the UK or even Mexico, Nigeria, Iran. <clears throat> the constitution was established in 1982. Uh, the current head of party and head of state is Xi Jinping, who has been president since 2013. Uh, the head of government is the premier, who is uh, Li Qinghuan. Uh, they are a unicameral legislature that functionally is nothing more than a rubber stamp uh, organization or a rubber stamp body. And they have a judicial branch, but they it's not independent and it lacks judicial review. <clears throat> so if we were trying to, you know, nail our checkboxes for anything that sniff of liberal democracy in looking at China, we would not not be able to kind of nail anything. The best way to describe China is looking at a system of parallel hierarchies. Uh, that is the Communist Party, and as the lovely note on the first slide says, it's all about the party. Uh, the state, which is what we would traditionally think of as the government organs, and then the military. They are all separate, but they interact with one another. And the dominant portion of these three is the Chinese Communist Party. With other countries, I'm able to show you kind of a nice little flow chart of who influences whom. And it's usually, you know, the general population elect these bodies, which select these bodies, which select these bodies. China, it's a bit messier. That if we wanted to look at the political structures, right, we see that the only entity that really has its hands on everything is the Communist Party, which is the middle of this chart. Uh, so we'll talk about these different organs uh, a little bit more in a traditional analysis of the executive, military, bureaucracy, and judicial branches, um, but just know that the most powerful organs of the Communist Party in China are the General Secretary, which is the head of the party, and the Politburo Standing Committee, which is about 18 individuals, and those are the most powerful men in China. Uh, but you'll see there's hierarchical organization, right, that there are uh, small party organizations to local, to provinces, to the National Party Congress, to the Central Committee, all the way up to the, the head of the party, that... There are local governments that build them all the way up to a national government that there are elements of government structures that are similar between the UK and the other countries that we talk about. But really, everything that you have to know about the political structure of China is that it's driven by the Communist Party. Here's another one of the, the videos from the Seeker Daily Test Tube News and now this uh, crew that... Uh, explains how China's government works, that that's the name of the video. And when you watch the video, it's literally 
here's how Chinese cop communism operates and here's why there are flaws in the system. And I usually am not a reader of YouTube comments. And uh, some of the people who had like the highest level of the, the comments closest to the video were like, this taught me nothing about how China's government operates or someone's was, you should go do some research and then retry this video. Uh, but where I think this video is at least accurate is that the only thing that it talks about is the Communist Party is the one who is in power. The Communist Party is the one who makes decisions. And that's all you really need to understand to look at how it functions because everything else just rubber stamps uh, the decisions made by the higher echelons of the, the party. But this is a good two to three minute explanation of kind of the modern uh, vestiges and challenges that the Communist Party is facing in China. Uh, so when we talk about the um, Chinese Communist Party, again, they believe in democratic centralism, that this is kind of a vestige that we see from uh, from Marx, appropriated then by Lenin and utilized by Mao, that they, you know, believe that, they now believe that society is led best by elites who understand what all of the people need and not just individuals. Uh, the There's a hierarchical nature in how it's structured, like I showed you on the previous, from uh, local party committees all the way up to the national party committee, and the head of the party is the general secretary. Uh, it used to be referred to as the chairman, uh, and that's why people refer to Mao as Chairman Mao, but people will say that he's the first and only chairman of China uh, because he was kind of the architect of, of all of this. The, the closest that you've heard people kind of use a, a distinction similar to that of chairman is when they talk about an individual being the core of, of the party, and that is a distinction that was recently bestowed upon um, Xi Jinping at a meeting of the government in like November of 2016. So the party is everything. Uh, there is a National Party Congress that has uh, 2,000 delegates and it meets every five years. So this national organ of how the party functions meets once every five years, and it just rubber stamps the decisions made by the Central Committee. That body also elects the Central Committee, which is kind of one step higher on the food chain. Uh, the Central Committee is about 340 members uh, that is elected for a five-year term by the 2,000 members of the National Party Congress. Uh, there are a limited number of, of candidates, and there is an election by secret ballot. This body meets annually. Sometimes they meet more than once. They hold what's called a plenum, uh, which is where they uh, carry out the business of the National Party Congress in these kinds of five-year uh, breaks between them convening. Uh, there's not a whole heck of a lot of debate in in either of these entities um, and that the Central Committee has a little bit more authority to to check um, actions of people on the top but the top layer again is is the top of the food chain. So the next level up is the Politburo. They're selected by the 340 members of the the Central Committee and these folks are the nuts and bolts of who makes decisions. Uh, they, they are the ones who craft the, the government policy um, and they work in, in secret conditions that they you know who's on it but you don't always know uh, what, what they're doing. Uh, they meet in a walled compound uh, on the lakes in the center of Beijing uh, it's heavily guarded, but there are no signs that they're like, hey, this is where the Politburo meets. Uh, it's it's guarded by the military. It's not identified on public maps. So it's almost like a meeting of a shadow government. Uh, there are about 25 members. 
uh, of this body that there is some flexibility uh, in terms of how many are selected to the Politburo. Even more powerful than the Politburo is the Politburo Standing Committee. The Politburo Standing Committee uh, is the elite of the elite, is that there are around seven members. Um, some years you can find 11 or 12, uh, and these members are selected by the Politburo. So you'll notice that as you move you know, closer to the top, the elites are choosing the elites who are choosing the elites who are choosing the elites. Um, membership in the Politburo Standing Committee is uh, kind of a mirror of which factions are the most influential in China at the time, and I'll kind of break these factions down for you uh, shortly. Uh, but this is where you can kind of look at the individuals on the Standing Committee and figure out who's tied to who, uh, which groups are the most influential in kind of dictating some policy, and you can look at this body to potentially predict who the next Chinese president uh, will be. The general secretary is chosen from the standing committee. The general secretary is the head uh, of the party. And again, most of them have been w exceptionally well educated that they follow the mold of being technocrats, uh, which we talked about at the end of the, the second section of lecture notes. So in, in China, uh, it's all about a matter of Guanxi, and we talked about Guanxi in the, the Mao lecture that is looking at your system of informal connections or uh, the, the relationships that you have, that you can really see a real blurring of the line between kind of public political relationships and personal uh, long-standing family uh, connections, that Guanxi will look at things like uh, a common birthplace, mutual acquaintances, similar work experiences, um, that you need these things to, to get things done. You've heard people talk about uh, political systems in like the West where you have like the good old boys network where it's the same group of people who have known each other for ages, that their families have worked together for forever, that these folks do stuff together uh, to get things done. Uh, so it's really showing that uh, your personal career kind of can dictate your uh, political standing. It can also be based on factions uh, or ideological differences that you have within uh, members of the party, and that these are also kind of pervasive through all levels. It's not just, you know, the people at the top are worrying about their connections to get to or stay at the top, but it's people at all levels kind of exploiting their their relationships for positions of power. Um, and Guanxi is successful in getting things done because if you are trying to make policy or trying to influence something and you know someone from the past that you can call, then you can call that person and they will, will take care of things. Um, that they can, you know, help you cut through red tape. But as we're seeing kind of an increase in the number of kind of persecuted corruption cases in China, uh, that this, you know, I'll scratch your back if you give me, you know, money or other kickbacks kind of relationship is something that has fed um, more, more allegations of corruption in, you know, recent years. If we want to talk about factions that do or have existed in the uh, Chinese government, we can find about six um, that have had mixed levels of, of power uh, that believe in or stand for different things. Um, you have conservatives who are hardliners who want to maintain traditional authoritarianism. They want to preserve the party, uh, the power of the party, the power of the central government, that they want to keep China as, as they've been for forever. So these are the same kinds of, you know, conservatives that you find, um, on a political spectrum, just about anywhere that these people are risk and change adverse that they want to kind of preserve traditional notions of things that they know uh, will and have worked. The next group uh, in kind of the, the broad swath of individuals in power or who have been in power in the, the Chinese Communist Party 
uh, are the reformers. Uh, these are people kind of like Deng Xiaoping, uh, who really, 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 really wanted an open door trade policy. Uh, people who are okay with capitalism, you know, regardless of whether or not it's a black cat or a white cat, it still catches the mouse. Um, that the reformers are individuals who have pushed for things like membership in the WTO, uh, pushing for like the United States to give China most favored nations trading status, people who have pushed uh, for any kind of international economic development. And uh, the reformers are some of the people who are um, influential now, because while we see, if you look down that Xi Jinping is part of the princelings that Xi Jinping is kind of doing some of the things that reformers uh, are happy of. And you can probably guess that there's some headbutting uh, between reformers and conservatives, right? That the hardliners who want to preserve kind of authoritarian uh, closed doors uh, Chinese socialism are going to kind of throw a bit of a fit if people are going to try to uh, liberalize China economically because, again, they're afraid of the mix of economic and political liberalization coming together. Uh, the third group are, are liberals. Uh, these people have had virtually no power since 1989. Uh, the liberals in the uh, Communist Party are individuals who uh, wanted more political liberties, more democratic movements, who wanted this blend of economic and political reform. Uh, and like I said, they've not been been much of a force in almost three decades. Uh, the next kind of cluster are princelings, and this is kind of the new uh, leading ruling class in China, um, that there's kind of a, an aristocracy of families that have revolutionary credentials, right? Part of that long march generation from from the days of Mao, but these are also people who sought out um, a technical education that these are people who sought to, you know, took advantage of the, the reforms kind of championed by Deng Xiaoping and pushed for uh, more education. So this is kind of your wealthy elites with long standing ties to the party uh, who use their connections to kind of build a business career and then use their business career to increase their um, political prowess or authority. Um, you have the Shanghai gang, uh, who believe heavily in Guanxi, that these are former associates of, um, Shang Zemin, uh, who was the, the president of China in the early nineties. Um, and you had the Chinese Communist Youth League, who was led by, uh, the president just before Xi Jinping, uh, Hu Jintao. Of the, the current seven member body of the Politburo Standing Committee, uh, five of them are from the Shanghai gang that Shang Zemin still has uh, a lot of influence. Uh, and there are two princelings, uh, you know, who are part of like the, the Xi Jinping kind of generation of individuals. And you have these two groups who are going to probably battle it out for a while. And as one of the results of the, the plenum in uh, the fall of 2016, when Xi Jinping received that kind of distinction as being the core of the party, uh, you're seeing more and more kind of allegiance to what Xi Jinping is pushing for. The other thing that Xi Jinping is doing is he's going after political rivals in the name of anti-corruption efforts, uh, which is, you know, some of these people legitimately corrupt, yes. Some of these people are manufactured in... Uh, how corrupt they may be, and you have outsiders making the argument that Xi Jinping is labeling some of the members of the, the Shanghai gang uh, as kind of corrupt entities so he can get more of his people uh, on the Politburo Standing Committee, and I believe the new selection for all of this stuff happens in late 2017. So if you remember anything that any, you know, political theorist has said about the role of factions uh, being something that's kind of divisive. You do see it play its way out in, in the Chinese Communist Party, um, especially in the name of maintaining hardline reform versus kind of incorporating more elements of, of Western capitalism. 
Uh, so we talked about Guanxi. I, you know, alluded a little bit to why corruption might be a problem. So again, pause the video, listen to my awkward silent pause uh, before I click on the next slide. But think about why, uh, you know, legitimate corruption of like a pay to play kind of scheme might be able to take a stronger foothold in China. Okay, so the answer to the question of why corruption is possible uh, is actually fairly easy to find, right? Uh, secret ballots, secret meetings, secret meeting places, right, all speak to a massive lack of, of transparency. So it's harder to kind of keep an eye on what, what's happening or what's being done or who's asking for change when most of the decisions are made by the two more secretive uh, elements of the party organization, right? If you wanted to know who who wanted to pass legislation or who wanted to get things done in the United States, you could look for all of those through like a Freedom of Information Act request uh, or looking on, you know, the House or the Senate's website, but you, you can't do any of that in China. Uh, there's not a lot of accountability, that there's no real way to check the power of the party because there are no opposition parties that kind of function or are allowed to function. Um, and that when we kind of look at elements of the, the government uh, across the next couple of slides, that you'll notice that the, the party and the government are kind of one and that when the party makes a decision, the government follows in lockstep with the 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 desire of the party and then the last one i kind of alluded to a lot is the existence of guanxi the the notion that you know we use our personal connections our familial connections our business connections uh to kind of get things done is something that may lead to uh, a strong layer of corruption so if we look in our triangle and we look at the second uh entity um there we'll talk about the state or the government uh like i said uh earlier that there are kind of branches of government that we can identify three branches but they're controlled by the 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 ccp that there's no independence there's no checks and balances that everything kind of rolls rolls downhill so if we want to start our analysis of china's government by talking about the executive branch um we can identify the the head of state is the president. Uh, the president serves five-year terms. They're limited to two uh, five-year terms. So for the most part, they're, you're guaranteed um, to be the uh, president for a 10-year period of time that the previous two uh, presidents before uh, Xi Jinping have, have been 10-year presidents. You have to be at least 45 years old, uh, which is the same requirement for the vice president and they tend to be senior party leaders. So when we talk about the general secretary of the party uh, and the president, they are the same person. So when you wanna see the marriage of the, the party and the state, that the head of the party and the head of the state being the same thing, you know that the party is calling all of the shots. Uh, the head of government is uh, Li Kikang. Uh, Li Kikang is the premier, which operates like a prime minister. Uh, they are formally appointed by the, the president, um, but they always come from the Politburo Standing Committee, that, you know, seven-member secretive group that is part of the 25-member secretive group. Um, and it's his job to direct the, the state council, uh, which kind of functions like a cabinet, that is the, the ministers who kind of make the, the decisions for bureaucracy. There is a vice president. The vice president is typically, whoops, sorry, someone who is groomed for uh, who is being uh, in, in, in charge. Um, and we've seen uh, some attempts to try and clear the ranks at the top of the party by forcing people to age out of power. Uh, in 2002, Zhang Zemin, uh, tried to kind of clear, you know, do some house cleaning uh, by saying that there are mandatory retirement ages, uh, 68 for top level leaders and 65 for, for senior level officials. So you do, I guess, have an, an age check, uh, but that's not really a good kind of transparent mechanism for checking and balancing things. Um, 
when we talk about the bureaucracy, it exists on all levels as it tends to in, you know, predominantly communist or socialist systems of, of government where, right, the government needs to be reaching into every uh, area or element of, of life to kind of control things. So there, it's huge, it's massive in both the size and scope. Uh, the bureaucracy is made up of cadres, and there are 30 million cadres uh, in in China. And these cadres are uh, people who exercise positions of, of authority. They, they may or may not be uh, party members in terms of being in the upper echelons of the party food, food chain, uh, but these are people who are, you know, fairly influential. Um, the cadre list covers people in and outside of the government. So not just, you know, government level officials, but people in universities, people who run banks, the people who run the unions and interest groups are all part of the bureaucracy. The media is part of the bureaucracy, all of this. Um, if the leader of a cadre um, wants to make any kind of change in, in personnel, like to appoint someone, to promote someone, to move or fire someone, uh, that affects anybody else who is part of a, who is part of a cadre, uh, they need to ask a senior level party official. Um, China will recruit leaders through the cadre list. This is, uh, very similar to the, the Soviet system of, uh, nomenclatura, the word that I can never say and never will be able to, so you can laugh at my inability to pronounce things correctly. But, it's this system of choosing candidates from low, lower levels of, you know, party hierarchy and then kind of moving them up the food chain based on their loyalty or their contributions to the, the party. That this cadre list is almost like a, a, a farm club system uh, in, you know, professional sports that you move them up from the lower A to the triple A before they make the big leagues uh, of, of baseball or the big leagues of government in China. Um there's also a dual, dual role within the bureaucracy that these, you know, the, the cadres, these entities, these bodies are supervised by higher uh, party organs uh, and comparable bodies in, in the Chinese Communist Party. So you might look at this and go, unions, banks, you know, universities, newspapers, that's a lot of different stuff that the state can't control all of it. Yes, they can. Uh, that you might think that all of these bureaucrats might have a little bit more free will or decision-making authority, but they don't because they have to pass everything that they want to do uh, through the national party uh, or through a higher-up party official to be able to do anything. The legislature is the National People's Congress. It is uh, the formal authority of the government to rule on the people's behalf. And this is different from the, the party Congress uh, that makes the decisions for the CCP uh, because it does a little bit more on paper that uh, they're a legislature. They do some of the things that a legislature can do, but they're really just a rubber stamp to approve things. Um, so unlike the party Congress, which meets once every five years, uh, the National People's Congress meets once a year in March for two weeks uh, to make decisions. And you can imagine the level of air quotes from the stank in my voice uh, that these are chosen from the lower People's Congresses, the lower uh, provincial uh, local levels of government. Um, that they make make some decision like they can help choose the president and vice presidential candidate which is essentially picked from the two you know the organizations in the party that are infinitely higher above them so really they they have power on paper that if i were to you know read you this list of things that show up in the chinese constitution it makes it sound like a legitimate legislature that they can amend and act laws. They can approve the state budget. They can delay uh, laws. They can declare war and end war. They can uh, recall individuals for positions of power or authority. 
uh, they can select people, you know, for the premiere. Uh, but they they don't really do any of that. They just rubber stamp what the Politburo uh, wants. If we want to talk about the composition of the, the list of this uh, 3,000 people, it's representatives from um, the, special, the, the SARS that we talk about, that there's a representative with Taiwanese ancestry that represents Taiwan, and we'll talk about that hot mess um, in a later uh, lecture, that there are representatives from all local governments, and that um, there are some members of the non-communist and powerless political parties, but they don't have much much of a say. Um, of the body, 20% of them are workers and farmers, 20% of them uh, are women, 15% of them are uh, ethnic minorities. There were three migrant workers in 2008 that were elected to represent the 115 million, uh, 150 million uh, part of the floating population. Um, so it looks like it's representative of a cross-cutting of Chinese society, uh, which is, I guess, a nice gesture to show that they get power from the people, but this body isn't powerful at all. Um, again, there are technocratic leanings to uh, this body as well, because the 90% uh, of the 3,000 delegates at least have a junior college, like associate's degree or above. More than half of them uh, have an advanced degree of like a, a master's, uh, a JD, a PhD, an MD, any of those kind of higher level degrees. So you are seeing kind of the infusion of the academically trained expert becoming politician. Uh, there's a court system. Uh, they have the People's Procur Procuratorate, another word that I can't say, like nomenclatura, uh, that supplies lawyers. Um, this body had no rule of law under Mao, but it's acknowledged today uh, especially because business liberalization has pushed for it, that you are seeing um, a lot of kind of push for uh, like civil uh, cases, contract law, that kind of stuff. Um, but the party has kind of weaponized the courts that uh, people are put on trial all the time for committing crimes, uh, but really it means that they're somebody's political enemy. Um, the criminal justice system works really, really quickly and harshly that it's got a 99% conviction rate, which probably shows you that this is not a, it's not a court that is looking at interpretation or administration of the law, that this is a court that's meant to get rid of problems. And again, it, it does function like a court that if there are people who, um, who are honestly not guilty or misunderstandings that it can happen, um, but there are also uh very few instances where that doesn't happen and uh we like to think of the united states as using the death penalty a lot but we are not number one in that category uh that the chinese court system is number one that they are the world leader in the use of uh the death penalty as a means of punishment the last element that we need to talk about is the military um so we'll talk about the PLA as the last kind of governmental or political institution. And I want you to think about uh, this quote from Mao Zedong, uh, and then we'll kind of talk about the prominence of the military. Mao once said that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Our principle is that the party commands the gun, and the gun must never be allowed to command the party. So what do you think this means in terms of power in China? And then we'll wrap things up with the, the final two slides on the military. So this quote is almost like the talk softly and carry a big stick uh, kind of approach to the, the party's use of the military. That senior level military officials uh, are senior level party officials. That uh, the military is still subordinate to the party. Uh, that there is a tie between the party and the military and that they will use the the will of the military they will use the gun they will use their strength 
to get things done. Think about what you learned about from the use of the military in Tiananmen Square, uh, that they use the military to suppress dissent, that they use the military uh, to help deal with more than just foreign threats, that they use it to deal with domestic issues as well. Uh, it is the world's largest military force with about 2.3 million active personnel, and this is including all of their branches together. Uh, but if you remember, the very first video that I had you look at from the first set of slides, uh, while they are the largest military in terms of staffing, technologically, uh, they are behind uh, the rest of the world uh, in terms of technology and force capabilities. Um, where, you know, people are afraid that China is going to attack the United States, but they, they just have a lot of bodies that they don't have a strong functioning, what we call blue water Navy uh, just yet, which means they can't uh, actively move people and things in order to be able to trigger um, some kind of foreign ground invasion. But they do have a Navy that's able to do um, a bunch of different stuff. Uh, you know, we'll talk about the problems in the South and East China Sea in kind of the, the final set of lecture notes. Um, we'll talk about how the military is used, but it's it's big, it's scary, but it's still a little bit technologically behind the rest of the world. Um, the central organization that governs the military, and this is where you kind of see the notion that the, the military doesn't control the party, that the party controls the military, uh, is looking at the Central Military Commission, or the CMC. Um, there are 12 members of the CMC. It is the uh, 10 highest ranking military officials, plus the president slash general secretary of the party, and the vice president. Uh, the chair of the CMC is always the president. It's always the highest ranking party member um, who kind of controls and dictates military decisions. So that's where you can see some parallels between, you know, the notion that our president is the commander in chief of the military, that, you know, maybe this is a civilian uh, military, right? Uh, but it's, it's used, we'll talk about the PLA, uh, quite a bit more in, like I said, the final lecture.